Welcome everybody. My name is Mina Jane and I'm the director of the Ashland Public Library. I am so excited for this panel of Indian heritage authors who are going to be talking about how their Indian heritage informs their writing. Um, we're very fortunate to have Amelie Howard, Alicia Rye, Anika Sharma, and Madi Sinha here. And we're going to be talking about their books and their inspirations and all of that in just a minute. Before we get to that, though, I'd like to say thank you to the Friends of the Ashland Library who support all of our programming and um, all of the libraries that have partnered with us on this program, because I just think when libraries get together, you know, we're magic. Um, you can buy signed books from any of our authors for this, from this program um, through Bank Score Books, and I will put a link for that in the chat as we, um, as we progress. If you have questions, put them in the Q&A, and um, I will be taking them as we... <laughs> um, as we go, I have a ton of questions, so don't you worry. We will get to lots and lots of information. But um, please feel free to ask anything um, about our writers and their heritage and their books and all of that. So um, I'm just going to really quickly tell you a little bit about our authors and then move right into our conversation. So Amelie Howard is um, USA Today in Publishers Weekly bestselling novelist. When she's not writing, she can usually be found reading, of course, being the president of her one-woman Harley-Davidson motorcycle club or power napping. I love that about her. <laughs> <laughs> Alicia Rye, you've probably read some of her books. She's an award-winning contemporary romance writer, and um, she is just fantastic. You should follow her on Twitter because she's always tweeting awesome and interesting co um, commentary. Anika Sharma is a coffee-loving, work-addicted, laughter-obsessed, wanderlusting girl who often finds misadventures in New York City. We'll see if they show up in her books. <laughs> and Madi Zina is a writer and practicing physician who loves the nervous system. Finding out if, they if that also informs some of her writing. Now, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Um, for, for me, like, I think this is amazing. <laughs> Um, so I'm just going to start off with a, a quick question to get us started, which is, um, you know, what is your Indian heritage um, specifically? And then we'll go from there. So I'm going to just start with um, Madi. Um, so both my parents are Gujarati and I was born and raised in the States. Oh, OK, great. Amelie? Um, I'm from the Caribbean, from Trinidad and Tobago. And my family emigrated from India. I, I want to say uh, to Pradesh. I'm probably pronoun butchering that pronunciation, but um, yeah. And my 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 father's family were Brahmins, and then my mother's family were from uh, Persia and also India, with a bit of French Creole in there. So I'm like all kinds of mixed. <laughs> Which is so awesome because we will be talking about the diversity within sort of the Indian heritage. Um, Anika. So my parents are both from a southern state called Andhra Pradesh, and so we speak Telugu at home. I was born in New Delhi, but I was raised in the U.S. Okay. I was also born near New Delhi. Um, Alicia? <laughs> uh, both of my parents uh, were from Mumbai, and I was uh, born uh, in the States. Uh, they immigrated here in the late 70s. Okay. So... Um, I think Madi, Amelie, and Alicia, you're all first generation um, mm -hmm. Americans. And Annika, your children will be first generation Americans. Okay. Just I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm a naturalized citizen here. My, um, because I was born in Trinidad. My kids are first generation. Yeah. Got it. Oh, I'm sorry. I missed that part. No, um, no, that's all right. <laughs> it seemed like you were sort of like that travel thing. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, I was everywhere. Everywhere. That's right. But that's interesting because I think Indians are everywhere. Um, Indians, Pakistanis, they have gone everywhere. I remember when I was dating that um, I met a guy from who'd grown up in Sweden. You know, I was like, I could live in Sweden. Um, anyways, <laughs> enough about me. Um, what brought you to be a writer specifically? And I want to ask um, if there were any particular challenges for you in becoming a writer because you have an Indian heritage. So I'm going to start with Amelie this time. Um. You know, becoming a writer, I in, in growing up in Trinidad and Tobago, um, my I was actually published when I was twelve. Nothing fancy. My English teacher lit a candle and said, "Write a poem." And I wrote a poem about a groom who burned his bride to the ground. I mean, my mom was a little worried, but you know, dark dark romance starts early. Um, and uh, then I got into I did a I won a Commonwealth um, essay competition at fifteen. Um, 
went to college and decided that I wanted to make money instead of write. <laughs> so I uh, majored in international studies in French, double major, and then got a job and then realized that something passion wise was sort of missing. And that's how I got back into the writing game. And I was published in 2011. But as far as like, you know, inspiration stuff, growing up, growing up in the Caribbean, we had, you know, authors like V.S. Naipaul, who was Indian, lots of really good, um, you know, Caribbean sort of writers. But here, most of that was, you know, trying to write in a, an American society for me. And my first book was, you know, all white characters. Um, and my journey to writing more inclusive characters came later. Mm, interesting. Annika? I much like I just wrote a lot when I was younger as well. I think my first book I signed with my agent and then got my first um, publishing deal with a very small press in uh, 2015. So uh, my first book came out and it was called The Rearranged Life, but then it ended up being taken off. We pulled the rights off of it and it got taken off shelves because the company was going downhill really quickly. So love chai and other four letter words. Um, very proud of the book. Don't get me wrong. So I don't want to sound like an ungrateful schmuck right now, but it's one of those things where, you know, how you compare your first book to the rest of your career and you look back and you think, I like it. Yeah. Like, the, I don't know if it matches who I am and what I think and what the world looks like for me. So I think I signed for Love Chai in 2017, which as we all know, publishing was a little bit of a different landscape. It's changed vastly in the last decade and the last, you know, 20 years. So, um, it's a much more conservative story than I think I would ever write if I was being really authentic to myself now. Um, completely, completely frankly, I think um, in 2017, it was a little bit more like kind of follow a certain formula at the time, at least that was my experience. Um, but, you know, going, it, it, there, is, there are challenges with that. And I think everyone here would, would uh, you know, it takes some time to be comfortable in your voice and to be able to be seen as a human being first and, you know, South Asian American or whatever you identify as like second and and kind of view your craft first, put your story out there first and then see everything else a second. And it, it takes a while and a lot of confidence building to be able to get to the place where you can just be like, be like screw it, I'm, I'm writing the story I yeah. want. So I think um, I, I, I'm still in that phase. Honestly, I think um, there is a little bit to unwind there sometimes where uh, you you feel like you kind of have to, to make your story a bit more Caucasian to be accepted or you know you kind of have to fight it sometimes whenever people push back and they say well you know do you want to and this is um kind of a silly example but like do you want to italicize what words are considered foreign you know like no I don't, I don't want to they're not foreign to me you know so those those things are still things that we all have to fight every day and I think um in those moments you know there are you, you just get reminded every once in a while that like yeah you're, we're not we're not quite there yet we have a long way to go um so so yeah I think and I started writing young, but it's been interesting to see just in the last five, 10 years, what it's, what it's been like and how it's changed. Mm -hmm. Alicia. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I have been writing for a really long time and, uh, my first book came out in 2008, um, and the landscape was extremely different, you know, like a panel like this would have been unheard of then. Um, and so it was just a really different time. I struggled a lot uh, to get published then. And uh, I was also writing more erotic romance then. And that was like, you know, not what people really wanted from someone who looked like me at the time. So uh, I really had to go to digital presses and then I went to indie publishing and I didn't get my first New York contract until about 2014 is when I signed that one, I believe. Um, so, yeah, it, it's, it was very, very challenging in the beginning. It still remains challenging, I know, for newcomers. Um, you know, not to say all the obstacles are removed yet, but it is a very different time, a very exciting time um, just to see more faces and, and to see more books on the shelves that I definitely didn't see and wouldn't have been, you know, probably the, the amount probably wouldn't have been quite permitted back then. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, definitely like a, a bit of a challenging road, but uh, but just a, an exciting time to be publishing. And I, you know, we only hope that it gets better from this and more stories can come out of it. And Madi? So um, I never really had the ambition to write until like later in life. And I think, you know, kind of going to it, what everyone else has said, I just hadn't seen any books by South Asian authors, you know, growing up that looked like the type of books I wanted to read. Um, 
So like in, you know, my twenties, I read a lot of chick lit and I, there were no South Asian characters in those books. And so it just didn't occur to me as like a thing that I could do. Um, and then after I, I was pregnant with my first child in 2010 and um, just signed up for a writing class at like a local university. And one of the re requirements of the class was you had to be working on a novel. So I just started writing what I knew. Um, I was a doctor and um, had had these experiences and it occurred to me like why don't I just write about them and um, I really didn't think there'd be an audience for what I was writing and uh, as part of the class we'd share our every 200 words we'd share with the class what we written and um, I started getting messages from the other people in the class saying oh hey we haven't seen your 200 words this week we want to find out what happens to this character and that was like the first time it ever occurred to me that like oh maybe maybe people want to read this and it's not just for me, and maybe it could be for for you know an audience. Um, and it took me ten years uh, to finish my first book, <laughs> and uh, so that was like twenty almost twenty twenty. And um, yeah, and that that first book is the book that is the White Coat Diaries. It was, it was my first published novel. It was the first novel I ever attempted, the first novel I ever wrote, and it just yeah, I think the timing was right, and it just kind of worked out. Well, people haven't read it. It's adorable. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but I, I was, you know, quirky, heartwarming, all of that. Um, but to go back to the challenging part of this, there's sort of like a stereotype for Indians to have certain career paths, engineer, doctor, lawyer. Um, I've rarely heard of anybody saying, hey, I hope my daughter or son grows up to be a writer, especially a women's fiction or romance writer, maybe nonfiction, maybe, you know, poetry, but never have I heard anything like this. So I'm wondering if you had any challenges or pushback from your families about being a writer. Um, and Anik, I'm going to start with you on this. I have been actually really lucky. My parents are super supportive um, and they always have been. I think they, when I remember probably my junior or senior year of high school, my mom's like, oh, you should go into journalism. And my dad's like, you should go into marketing. And I was like, no, I'll be a doctor. And they were like, yeah, no, I don't really think you're cut out for that kid. But like they, you know, they, they were like, you know, let's just be supportive. Let's, she wants to be a doctor. Let's let her be a doctor. Totally did not become a doctor. So like, yeah. And then when I finally came down and like, I remember when I wrote, when I wrote The Rearranged Life, it was, I think, 2012, 2013. And I came downstairs and I'm going to write my first book. And my dad was just like, oh, finally, like, you know, so I think at that, I've been very lucky. I think my parents, my brother have been incredibly supportive and, and I haven't had that pushback, but I do know that, um, a lot of creatives generally do because it is kind of a new realm. It does go against a lot of ingrained belief and it, it goes a lot of, it goes against a lot of like intergenerational trauma that people have gone through um, that have, you know, come to these sort of belief systems um, about what you should do and what you shouldn't do and what, what a set career path is. And, um, and I recognize that I'm pretty lucky. Mm -hmm. How about you, Alicia? Did you get any? Um, so I am also a lawyer, so I feel like I can't be too much oh. of a but uh, I definitely, I, I think it is important to remember, like, especially for my family in particular, my mom struggled a lot with insecurity. Like she didn't, she never had a lot growing up. In fact, she had like nothing growing up and, you know, her mom was a widow. And so she had a pretty, um, and when she went to America, she had like an even harder life. And so for her, I think her main thing was always that she wanted her children to be secure in a way that she wasn't, which is very understandable. Um, but she never, like, I went to law school of my own volition. She never pushed us. Um, and she's always been extremely proud of, of my writing. She's proud of, I mean, we could, any of her kids could do, she, there's four of us, any of us could do it, literally anything and she'd be so proud of it. And she like hands my books out to strangers now, like carries a stash of them. And, and she thinks I'm like really famous, which is very cute. Like I was um, getting soon and, and I was complaining about the cost and I'm like, oh my God, everything's so expensive. Again, she's like, well, why don't you just get a TV show to sponsor it? And I was like, that's <laughs> how famous I am, unfortunately, <laughs> but uh, it's cute that she thinks that I am. And she's really proud of whatever she thinks I am. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> uh, Madi? Um, yeah, so I, um, I mean, I grew up in the, in the 80s and um, I think I was actively discouraged from being a writer. And, you know, I have a lot of thoughts about this being an Indian doctor. Um, I think, you know, I think fear drives so much of the immigrant experience. And, you know, I know for my parents, um, you know, coming over here and feeling financially insecure and then looking around them and seeing that the secure people who looked like us were mostly physicians. 
Um, and there, you know, and then we can go into the whole discussion of why that is and the, the, you know, immigration laws in the US and the 1965 Hart Sellers Act, which made it easier for um, certain professionals, especially foreign medical graduates to immigrate to this country. And that being the reason that there are so many uh, Indian physicians, I think that's something that we don't talk about enough and that that was an intentional choice on the part of the US government. Um, however, you know, the consequence of that is that my parents, neither of whom was a physician, were surrounded by people who looked like them, who were doing better than them, who were physicians. And so to them, the path to success was clear. It was laid out there for us. Um, and the cost of failure was too high. We had nothing to go back to in India. My parents left everything behind. Um, and there was literally nowhere for us to go if, you know, if my brother and I like didn't, you know, make it, so to speak. So that pressure was kind of always there, but it was like out of a, a desperation. And so I don't fault my parents for, you know, was I pushed, you know, into going into medicine? I was. I mean, fortunately, I love it. It's, you know, it's it's who I am. Um, it's, I would never give up being a doctor. I, I enjoy it. And, uh, it, you know, brings a lot of meaning to my life. Did I have choices when I was a kid? I didn't. I really didn't. It was either, you know, medicine or you know, I don't know. It was it was basically like this is what you're going to do because this is the way we're going to secure our family in this country. And so, you know, as a kid, I think I felt resentful of it. As an adult now, I think I can look back on it and and understand that there was so much fear and uncertainty, and it was a matter of, in their minds, a matter of survival. Whether that was accurate or not, you know, it's it was hard at that time. There was no internet. <laughs> there was no way to find anything else out about the world, right? I couldn't go online and like Google, like how to become an author, right? Like there was no option like that. So, you know, we had to go with what we knew of the world and our understanding of the world was so narrow. It was just who we interacted with in the, in the South Asian community, you know, in our town in New Jersey. Um, and so that's what my parents based their decisions on. And so, you know, for better or worse, like that's where I am, you know. Mm -hmm. Amelie? Um, my parents also were very um, supportive um, with writing. Um, I think when I went to college and decided not to go to grad school, there was a little bit of freak out moment because, you know, get your master's, get your PhD, you know, we have to progress. And I was like, no, I want to, I, I got into grad school, but I decided not to go. I wanted to, like I said, when we were chatting earlier, like I wanted to make money and I wanted to travel. Um, so I worked for this global telecommunication telecommunications company um, and, you know, advanced quite far in my career on Wall Street. And then after that, you know, I got very, I don't know, didn't feel the passion for it. So I started kind of just writing my first book and that was probably 2009, 2010. Now it was YA. So my mom was like my first beta. She was like my first editor. She read everything. And then when it got racier, she'd skip over the racy parts. I'm like, mom, you have three kids. Like, you know what this is about. Come on. But you know, she same thing. Like with Annika, she like shares my books with all her friends, and I think it was Annika who said, "Oh, maybe Alicia said it." Like, um, but yeah, um, yeah, like you know, she has a stack of my books in her living room, and you know, it's nice to see that support is really great. So, yeah. And I did want to comment that the stereotype is just that it's a stereotype. You know, that it's it's how people see you know put people in boxes. Um, obviously we're all different and our parents are all different and you know they are not going to be the, the that stereotypical typical parents so i'm really glad to hear all the different stories about your histories um so the next question i have is um oops, I'll let me find it actually <laughs> um when you're writing your books what's the most uh, um important thing for you oh i got my envy this weekend um it's beautiful Thank you. I said I wanted the this one, so just in case I needed this finger. Um, it, was, <laughs> it, was, it was an Indian wedding. <laughs> um, so what is it about your writing that makes it the most authentic for your characters in terms of their um, what you're trying to get across um, to your readers? And I'm going to start with Alicia on this one. And I'm going to say that I loved, was it the right swipe because of the sort of arranged thing? Like at the end, they were just like, we're going to get married. And everybody's like, what? I just love that. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I kind of approach all the, my characters as different individuals, which is why 
Um, you know, heat levels may vary. There might be, you know, <laughs> things going on. Uh, it gets, especially if you write a number, number of books, it can, you know, it can get boring for me if I, if I follow a formula or if I put the same people in there again and again. Um, so yeah, I try to keep it fresh for me because I know that's how to keep it fresh for readers. Um, but yeah, before I start writing, I just make character, um, profiles. I make little bios for them. I figure out, you know, what, what are their likes and dislikes? What's their favorite food? Like anything I can possibly think of to make them individuals, like fleshed out individuals in my own head. And then hopefully that carries through the book. Mm -hmm. Um, just, just to jump on that, um, is that for all of your characters or that's pretty much you keep, create them all equally. It doesn't matter if they're Indian, white, you know, American, whatever. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think, yeah, for, for all, for all characters, I think it, it's important to do for, for anybody. I mean, as long as you treat them like sort of empathetic, you know, individuals in their own right, people will respond to them the same way. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Madi, I think. I kind of lost track of my circle. <laughs> um, I think I'm still figuring it out. You know, I've only got two books under my belt so far and I'm working on a third and um, I'm trying to to figure out kind of how like what what my process is in terms of that. At this point, I'm still just writing from my own experience. You know, the character in the White Coat Diaries was based really closely on my own um, experience in, in med school. Um, and then for my most recent book, At Least You Have Your Health, the main character is a a doctor who's a mom with kids and that's that's me um and you know the character is not me um but a lot of her like experience of being Indian is based on my own experience mm -hmm. oh interesting but, so uh, the more books you write what is that you you know you're gonna have to maybe go further afield from that I think so I think is like as my writing matures I think that I'll feel more comfortable sort of kind of like taking it like the way that more mature writers do where they take on the skin of, of a totally different character like I, I find that still a little bit hard to do and I'm still trying to figure out how to do it so I'm just taking notes from people like Alicia who've been doing it a while. <laughs> um, Amelie? Um, I feel like you know when I started publishing um, it was a different landscape different time um, so that informed a lot of um, my writing a lot of my characters um, as kind of the years passed and I I don't want to say got more comfortable with myself, but it is kind of like getting com comfortable with yourself in the publishing um, arena and being sort of willing to dive into who you are and put that on the page. It's not always easy. Um, and I think as I got more confident, instead of having the BIPOC characters in the background, they started having more main character energy, which meant, you know, like they were the heroine or the hero of the book and you know I started putting characteristics from my own background into them um and you know I mean I write mostly historical so like my um now my 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 inclusive romance series you know you have to do the research and because I want the research to always back up the narrative especially if I'm writing about a person of color so you know like in the princess stakes the main inspiration for that was Sophia Duleep Singh who was um you know, an Indian prince, uh, princess in Queen Victoria's court. Um, and I think details like that are really important because BIPOC people existed in historical times. It's important to ask those questions and get the answers that yes, we were there. You know, LGBTQ plus people were there. Yes, you know, also there. Um, and moving into like, you know, writing more books like young adult, even middle grade, you know, I have a middle grade Caribbean folklore book coming out in 2024. I have a YA uh, BIPOC um, Bridgerton meets the Count of Monte Cristo, but it's a completely BIPOC LGBTQ positive cast. Um, and I'm really proud of that. I'm really proud that I'm at that spot where I can say, yes, I'm gonna include my background. I'm gonna include people that were in my life when I grew up, when I was younger, um, because I am proud of those things. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like it's a mix of your own own experience for and all the research that you do. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, you know, I'm if we're talking about representation, representation cannot fall the weight of it on one story. Um, I don't know who it was who was saying earlier that we need more stories. And yes, we definitely need more stories from people of color um, from the entire, you know, all over the world. The more we have, you know, the better it is for everyone. Mm -hmm. Annika? 
I think I'm very similar to Maddie in the sense that like, you know, I'm uh, two books in essentially. I mean, I don't really count this one in 2015 most of the time anyway. So um, I, I feel like I'm learning all the time and, you know, it's, it's, it's beginning to like with Love Chai, it wasn't really my story, although some of the elements of the friendship and just having like a circle of brown friends who are all wild and crazy. And there's like one of each personality in it. And like that felt a lot more like my life and like the friend, I could imagine them as my friends. And that was probably the thing that I brought the most. Um, but in terms of being able to feel like I can go to sleep at, you know, at night and feel like I did a good job of conveying what my friends, what my family, what my life looks like, um, or, you know, that I, that I did an, a good job of representing, um, the characters in my story. That's, st that's still something I'm working through. And I think much like Alicia was saying, I've started to now do like more outlines of profiles of each character and try to figure out like their motivations and what their backgrounds are like, and what does that mean for them in terms of their life and all of those things. But, um, like Molly was saying, I'm pretty new at this too. So I think every time Alicia talks, I'm just going to be taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am also taking notes. I'm not a writer, but I just like to take notes from everything you say. Um, so the, ne the next two questions are really about um, diving into the diversity of Indian heritages, because obviously you all have such a diverse background yourselves, and you know there's, there's things like language and where you're from in, in the Indian, I'll say diaspora, um, you know, the religions, there's so, you know, there's just so, so many things. So how do you um, pick and choose what's going to end up in your books? And this came to, this sort of question came to me because of uh, Bridgerton. Um, Amelie, you had mentioned that a little while, a minute ago, is that, you know, it was so wonderful to have Indian characters in there. But then the pushback was really like, wait a minute, you took aspects of different subcultures and just threw them in there like that was just one thing. And so I was like, well, I liked it, but I think people really had a problem with it. So I'm, I'm curious about like how you how you handle that. And I'm going to start with Madi this time. Yeah, I think, you know, I try to keep in mind that not everybody's going to be happy no matter what I do. Um, and that, you know, there isn't, I mean, there's a billion of us. There's not, you know, one story that, ev no, that everyone's going to be happy with the representation. And, and I mean, it kind of makes me think like, so my first book, The White Coat Diaries, was about a young um, bookish kind of nerdy, um, Indian doctor. And some of the pushback I got on that book was that a young nerdy Indian doctor was a stereotype. And I, I get that. I, I get why that, why people would feel that way, but it's also my experience. I was a young nerdy Indian doctor, right? Like, and I wrote that book based on my own experience. It's like weird to hear that your lived experience is a stereotype. Um, and I think that's just like, everyone's experience of it is going to be different. Everyone's expectations going in to a book is going to be different because everyone is looking to find themselves, you know, in, in your work. And, uh, you know, for South Asian people, there are still so few choices, relatively speaking, right? So like every book that comes out by a South Asian author, I think there's going to be like a certain percentage of people that are like, this doesn't represent me. And like, obviously it's not going to represent everyone, but the disappointment is still there, right? So I try now to not to let that bother me and to just sort of, you know, write the character that I created and, you know, how do I decide like which elements of their culture? I think it has to, you know, for me, it has to serve the story. So um, in my first book, there's a scene with a, with a puja where uh, the main character's brother and sister-in-law bought a house and they're having like a puja and the puja was like this fun setting to sort of show some cultural elements. Um, so I, you know, again, based that on you know, the pujas that I've been to, um, because that was like the easiest thing for me to do, you know, as a, as a new writer, there's so much to figure out without having to like worry that I'm getting someone else's culture or subculture wrong. So um, yeah, I'm still basing it, you know, on, on what I've experienced personally. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's not going to be for everyone and that's okay. Absolutely. I know it's funny us asking these questions because like the other, some other cultures don't necessarily get asked these questions, yeah. right? Um, Amelie, I, I was specifically thinking about you with this because you got a lot of pushback on one of your books. Um, I, mm -hmm. I read it and then I started reading some of the reviews and I was like, what? I didn't get that. So how do you handle that? How did you handle I, that? I, I, I can't take credit for this amazing statement right now, but I read somewhere that somebody said representation is not relatability. And when you think about something like that, it's true, right? And I talked about 
the weight of representation falling on one story. Um, look, I mean, the pushback that happened with the Princess Days was my use of a word that in the Caribbean is more celebrated than it is in the United States. It was a complete, um, you know, I it's just, I wanna put it down to like international uh, differences, cultural differences, um, but that doesn't mean that if your work causes, you know, harm to someone or is problematic, that you shouldn't try to take the steps to do the work and fix it. Um, luckily, I had a publisher that was, you know, 100% behind me. My agent was also 100% behind me. You know, we delayed the release of the book and changed some of the stuff that did have, you know, problematic um, things. But I am proud of that book because this is the cover. It has a brown woman on the cover. It is gorgeous. The dress is gorgeous. And you know what? I mean, like Madi said before, like not everyone is going to love your story. And you also, as a brown writer, I mean, we're talking about like trying to fit into boxes that society has kind of said we need to be in. And you never want to like, you know, create any waves. Um, I grew up feeling like that, at least, especially when I went to Colby, which was like an all white school. Um, I never felt like I fit in or was comfortable in my identity. So, you know, when people speak out, say stuff about you kind of like pull back and also you're not supposed to engage on social media. But, so, I mean, it was a very tough time for me, um, but I am proud of the work that I did. Um, you know, I love the story. I love the fact that, like I said, there was a brown woman front and center. The second book has a brown man front and center. Um, I grew up in a multiracial, multi-ethnic household. My father was Indian. Like I said, he was an Indian pundit, so a priest. My mother was from a Muslim family, you know. That was also like, oh my gosh, what's happening here? You know, we grew up celebrating Eid, celebrating Diwali, celebrating Christmas, celebrating everything. Because the Caribbean is like that. It's a complete melting pot of different cultures, different races. And it's a wonder, it was a wonderful place to grow up because it gave me a very unique perspective on the world, which, you know, I'm, I want to share more of. I want to share more of. But when stuff like this happens, it makes you, especially me as a, you know, a brown woman who's still trying to figure out who she is, it makes you nervous to kind of want to put yourself so baldly on the page. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know if that's the same for everyone else, but definitely for me. And, you know, I'm going to keep writing. Um, I'm going to keep surrounding myself by with powerful BIPOC authors who, you know, want to tell their stories and have great things to say and are supportive. Because I think we need this kind of support, especially within our own, you know, communities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're really good at tearing each other down, you know, it's, it, it, just in different ways. But I really like your book and I didn't get that. I didn't get it. I didn't know what, I didn't understand the pushback until I, I was like, what's going on here? Um, but Thank people have I mean, Madi talked about it before that scrutiny that you get because you know there's such a narrow selection. But as we get more, you know, maybe people will look at it the, through the lens like they do all the other books. You won't get judged on a strange kind of double standard. And mm -hmm. I mean, I think it definitely exists. It exists from buyers. It exists with agents. It exists, you know, um, with people who read the books as well. Mm -hmm. Right, Anika. I am so sorry. We're going to have to repeat that first question because I got lost in what everybody was saying and now I've lost the, the plot completely. <laughs> so <laughs> That's okay. I was just asking about your writing within the diversity of Indian culture because there's so many religions and languages and whatever. And how do you um, write, you know, like how do you keep it tight, I guess, we'll see, or have you had pushback from your books because they weren't? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So when you when you'd originally asked that, I, I the first experience that I thought of was actually very recently. I was in a meeting where we were talking about a potential book club appearance for a university. And the per one of the people who was heading up that panel um, asked where I was from. And I said, my parents are, um, are Hyderabadi. And she said, oh, I'm from Hyderabad too. And, and she was started talking about the food. And, um, and someone asked, you know, like what kind, they, they'd asked some, some sort of follow-up about what kinds of food experiences you can have in Hyderabad. And we're both sort of raving about, you know, the beauties of what the city is like. And, and she goes, yeah, you know, samosas are like this beef filled pastry. And it made me laugh because I was thinking, well, I'm, and, and she's Muslim and she lives in a different part of Hyderabad. So that, that is 100% her experience. And then I'm thinking, well, like I'm like a Hindu vegetarian. So my samosas are filled with potatoes. And then she was like, well, you know, like, yeah, biryani is chicken or lamb. And I'm thinking, okay, well, my 
biryani is usually vegetarian. But it was so funny because I kept thinking if, if she had written a book and I had written a book about being Hyderabadi, then like ultimately these readers are going to get a Hyderabadi experience filled with these amazing beef filled samosas <laughs> and this like amazing chicken biryani. They could easily also get a vegetarian, you know, nerd who's just like, you know, going comatose on, on vegetarian biryani. So like, you know, it was it was, it was just funny because I remember thinking in that meeting, like just the experience of saying I'm from Hyderabad. Oh, me too. Comes across so differently. Just, it just in one meeting. So imagine, you know, for a reader to look across all of these books by South Asian authors, they probably won't find that exact match. Um, and there is going to be some level of variation and there is some level of pressure with that. I talk about that a lot with some of my writer friends, like, you know, you know, it, it is all and well and good to say like, put your story first, but sometimes you get into your head a little bit and you're like, oh, like people are going to read this and they're going to think I'm, you know, talking out of my butt. And like, you know, so I think. Imposter. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and I think, you know, with, with, with Love Chai, one of, one of the, one of the criticisms, I think that the really, that hit, but also really made me think and, and honestly made me, I think, take it forward um, meaningfully was, you know, someone said like, well, these are there, this is sort of, um, uh, you know, like one of the more conservative stories. And even I agreed with that. So I thought, okay, next time, like maybe don't stick to it just because you're afraid to, to, to land the punch, like just do what you, what you have to do and, and make it a more authentic story um, and more true to your experience and the experience of your friends, perhaps then, then, you know, what, what you think publishing is going to do or what you think like works culturally or what you think works in your, in your group of friends or whatever. Um, and there's definitely, you know, there's pressure across the board for that, but I feel like at the end of the day, you have to learn from the feedback that you're getting when it comes down to it. And you also have to, to kind of rid yourself of the pressure to be the representation as opposed to being a facet of it. And, and that's not as easy as, you know, it's, it's much, it's much easier said than done. And at the end of the day, like, because, you know, as we've mentioned multiple times, there are a few of us. And so there, there is a little bit of that pressure. It's going to be inevitable for a while. Um, and I think, you know, readers are hungry to see themselves um, all the time. And that's rightfully so. So like, what can we do to be better, but also what can we do to tell our stories and maybe make the stage bigger so that more people with those stories can come on so they can find someone that they think like, oh my God, this person wrote about me, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and um, so yeah, the long, I feel like all my answers are always long and convoluted, but I think, um, you know, at the end of the day, like, you know, it's, it is, it's a pressure there. The stereotypes are there, but some of them are, <laughs> excuse me, based in reality. And, and, you know, you kind of have to, yeah, you have to find clarity on your own before you can dive in. Mm -hmm. Well, I kind of stopped listening because I started thinking I needed to have a samosa and a cup of chai. So <laughs> <laughs> thanks for that, Annika. <laughs> Um, Alicia, what about you? Oh, you're muted. That okay. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, every time you know I see another South Asian author, I just go, oh, thank God, because <laughs> it is really intense. Uh, I've been feeling it for a long time, and so uh, you know, every time someone else comes on board, I'm like, this is great, like fantastic. Someone else, you know, just sort of spread that pressure out on. Um, I can tell you that I, I used to be so grateful for any form of South Asians in media. Like I was always like, whatever it was, I would take it because I grew up with nothing. And especially in the romance and, you know, the publishing community, there was nothing. And so whenever there was anything, I'd be grateful. I didn't care if I resonated with it or not. So I actually think it's really great. Um, the fact that people do feel free to critique a little bit now and, and, you know, examine their media critically and, and think about it because that means maybe there's a little bit more, you know, maybe we have a few more options and that's a good thing for the generation after us. Um, so I don't, I don't really mind it. I, I do think, you know, sometimes people do need a reminder, you know, again, everything is not going to represent everybody and that's okay. It's okay for, um, you know, there to be words in a book written by South, a South Asian author with South Asian characters that, um, sorry, that, you know, I, I don't know, or, or characters that I don't really quite relate to, um, because it's a big, big continent, and it's a big diaspora that came out of it, and a lot of us, you know, that a lot of the diaspora kids, too, are also 
a lot of it's dependent on when our parents came over and the snapshot of India that they carried with them and the snapshot of South Asia that they carried with them. So, so there's just so many factors at play, you know, but, but all in all, you know, you can't, you can't make everybody happy all the time. All you can do is try not to hurt anybody and, and hope that you're, you know, you, that you feel competent at, at doing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. I think Which another is, thing about that, oh, sorry, go ahead. If, um, I, Alicia, first off, you're like one of the OGs. So I feel like for, for you, you probably carried a lot more of that brunt. So thank you for just managing that for the 10 years before we all came along, I think. But uh, <laughs> I mean, going along sort of with what you were just saying, but also I, I think one of my biggest learning points and, and, and kind of a pain point, but also, but more importantly, the learning point is, um, is recognizing where our privileges within our identities within the diaspora can benefit us versus like, and recognizing when we write, that if we write our characters in that image, that they will potentially hurt readers who don't come from those same privileges. And I think, so, you know, one of those things is, um, and like casteism is something that, you know, I, I have inadvertently done and it's something I vowed never to do because it was just something that like, I'm privileged enough, I've never heard thought, I had to think about it. And so like, it was, <laughs> it wasn't meant to be that way, that the reference in, in one of my, in Love Chai was like, not even remotely meant to be that way, but obviously, you know, impact matters far more than intention does. And so that was a huge learning point for me. And now I like, whenever I'm writing characters, I'm thinking about their names. I'm thinking about how I'm naming their last names. I'm thinking about what are their backgrounds and what are their jobs? And like, is this something that, you know, they were granted because they probably had privileges in India that, you know, carried over somewhere. Um, and when I'm approaching people, do I want to approach with, from a point of empathy or do I want to kind of just be like, well, I'm just telling the story, you know, cause I would rather, you know, be, be the former and, and try to think through this and, and do this thoughtfully. And, you know, and in, in a perfect world it, it, and not even in a perfect world, if you do it right, it won't impact your story. Like, you know, it, I think that was, that was a big thing for me. And I didn't realize, you know, <laughs> like for example, I have my come from a very traditional South Indian family. Um, but if I if I say like you know like oh we're a Brahmin family that that comes with a heavy implication and that says a hell of a lot about me and my family whether it's intended to or not. Mm -hmm. And so there's certain points that you know when I write I'm not putting that in there because I, I recognize how much trauma comes from casteism as a whole and it's a system that. I'm a part of that, you know, like I don't have a right to speak about that in, in, a, in a way that doesn't hurt other people. And it's the same thing. I think even, you know, like, like I love being Indian. Indian Independence Day is exciting because there is a level of patriotism that's associated with that. My parents came from India. I love it. It's a beautiful, you know, like it's a beautiful country and there's so much there, but <laughs> excuse me, Indian independence also comes with traumas for other people in the South Asian diaspora. So I think it's very important that, we, you know, when I'm writing, and I know for all of you too, it, whenever we're writing, it's very important that if we identify as Indian American or, you know, it doesn't erase the intersectionality of also being South Asian and realizing that like the, the things that we write about, the lived experiences we might have could also potentially be traumatic for someone else. And just to be cognizant of that when you're writing, it's been a huge, steep learning point. And I think, you know, um, <clears throat> it also comes from like, like I, I mentioned before, I have a podcast. And so like, I've learned freakish amounts of things I never knew before I went into that just from that experience alone. But, you know, it, the goal is to keep getting better and to recognize like, you know, these, these identities, they're far more than we ever know. There's a lot more trauma associated than we ever know. We have to be cognizant of human beings first. We need to be able to keep learning and we need to recognize that while we might identify as something and that's okay, we might have privileges that we need to be cognizant of within our, within our art form too. And to piggyback on that, I had said it earlier about the like my, my my family emigrating to Trinidad and and being Brahmin, and I didn't mean to be casteist or whatever it is. But the reason I said it comes from my baggage, and my baggage is that everyone thinks that anybody who went to the Caribbean from India went because they were poor and had no opportunities. So I mean, everybody is carrying something that they've learned from their parents or grown up with, or trying to like use to define who they are whether that's based on privilege or not but yeah I mean when you take into account like you said before like you know all of the different parts of it yeah it's across the board 
Yeah, and I definitely wasn't targeting at you the whole time. I kept oh, no, no, no. I, well, as soon as you said it, I was like, oh, shit, what did I do? Oh, sorry. No, I no, I wasn't. I was, you know, I was like, oh, my God, what did I say? But we're, we're always checking ourselves like that, though. And I think that's part of being part of a marginalized group. You're always checking yourself, making sure that you didn't say something that either hurt, insult, offends, you know, and it's hard. It's hard. It's hard. It's hard because I don't, you know, I didn't grow up in India. We barely, I mean, like, I don't speak Hindi. I know Miranam to say my name is, and that is it. That is all I can say. You know, and I have friends who like we hang out and they speak in Gujarati, and I'm just like, I, I don't, I don't understand what you guys are saying, but it sounds awesome. And they're saying bad things to me. <laughs> One good thing about knowing another language, I guess. Um, Mati, did you want to um, respond to this as well? No, I mean, I think I, all I say is I think that it just. Um, yeah, I think it's just part of the challenge of being South Asian and a writer in, in this time is not just that, you know, publishing doesn't necessarily want all of our stories, right? There's still like the difficulty in selling our stories unless they fit, you know, what the publisher is looking for. And for a long time, and probably still, um, you know, like literary fiction has been about like suffering in India, right? And like, uh, like your Indian immigrant pain is something that seems to be very popular. Um, and then, and, and you know, one of the reasons that I love romance so much, and I'm so excited to be on this panel with, with romance writers, um, I don't write romance, but I love it, um, is I feel like romance has blown the doors open on that in a way that like no other genre has been able to do. Um, you know, I'm a women's fiction writer and I, uh, you know, feel this that, there just there aren't a ton of women's South Asian women's fiction writers still, um, and the stories that we are allowed to write that the publishing seems to want are still I think relatively narrow. It's like you know, big happy Indian wedding and like uh, you know tell us about how you were an immigrant and how that was hard and how your parents were restrictive or whatever. Like that there seem to be like certain themes that publishing like really gravitates towards, um, and it's difficult to sort of get your foot in the door when you're not writing that and then there's romance which just like does whatever the hell they want and it's it's glorious like thank you to to all of you for writing what you do because it makes it easier for those of us who are not in romance to try to like push our stories forward and say like but look like there's this like Bridgerton romance coming out like that's popular and so like you know and that has South Asian characters so like let me write my South Asian vampire story and like I it, you know give it a chance um so you know I, I think it's I think it's great what's happening and I and I do think that romance is like leading the way in terms of genres in terms of our representation mm -hmm. um but you know I think the whole like self-policing and worry worrying about um you know inadvertently causing harm is like just like another thing that adds to the challenges of, of trying to be a South Asian writer in, you know, in this time. And, you know, it just, it kind of just is what it is. I'm not sure that there's much we can do about it. And again, you know, we want to be responsible and we, we don't want to cause harm, but, um, you know, like Amelie said, it's, it's difficult to know what you don't know. Um, and like, how can you be expected to know what, what's going to hurt someone who has a completely different lived experience from yours like how could you possibly even begin to research like what the word brahmin means to someone who lives you know somewhere where you've never been who you've never interacted with like that's difficult i mean you can spend all day on social media and find people who are offended by all manner of things and so you, i think that, you know what you don't want to do is get scared off of writing period you know so i was talking to a writer friend of mine i was telling her oh i want to write this story with like an indian like villain because you never see like a like a female Indian villain like we never get to be like the bad guy and I was just kind of like spouting off about it and saying oh wouldn't it be cool if she was like this badass ninja South Asian you know warrior bad guy and and my friend kind of was really concerned she stopped me and said well you know you'd have to be really careful with that because if you chose the wrong name or you chose the wrong background for her you could really end up offending people and I immediately just dropped the idea. I was like, well, okay, I'm not oh. gonna do that then because that's oh. that seems so difficult to do. And I don't wanna be wrong because I don't wanna be like kicked out of publishing. I don't wanna be like canceled and never be able to write anything again because I said the wrong thing or wrote the wrong thing. So I think it's like a, a constant source of struggle for all of us, you know, that sort of thing. 
-hmm. You said that, and I thought of that triple X. I can't remember what movie it was, but there was like this Indian woman who was one of the villains and she was riding a bike and she wore black leather. And I was like, holy crap, she's so hot. I was like, somebody needs to write a story about this woman. You know, right, I, like, I, I would read, read that. that. Yeah, write it in a minute. So I would much. read that in a minute. <laughs> like totally. I want that to be a book, but then it's like, there's the minefield of like, who could I potentially offend if I do that incorrectly? And I'm not confident enough in myself uh, in, at this point in my career to take any chances, you know, in that way. Um, so yeah, it's, you know, it's a complicated thing. I write a Harley. I could, I could be it. I'm kidding. <laughs> right about you. <laughs> no way. It's <laughs> funny. I can't get in black leather. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe this is one that Alicia should take on. <laughs> do um, it. I do it. I have quite a few women villains and I think, I think it's important. I use the word competent before and it's a word I use a lot in, in the legal profession. You know, that's the word you use. Like, are you competent to represent this client? And for the most part, it's an internal scan. It's like, you know, am I competent enough? Can I do this to the best of my ability within the confines of, you know, our ethics and morals? Um, and I use it for writing too. So, you know, sometimes, yeah, there's definitely books that I've shelved and characters I've shelved because I think, oh, I'm not, I don't feel really competent enough to write that story. I don't feel competent to, to do it this way. So I'll shelve it for now. Um, and and it's, it's fine. Like it's, you know, it, there's plenty of stories out there that I do feel competent to tell. So it's not like I'm, I feel like I'm losing anything or missing out on anything. And I think somebody maybe could do it better and, and you know, really blow, blow everyone's socks off. I will say, um, as to your point that, you know, romance is blowing the doors open. I think the grass is always a little bit greener and I wouldn't say that we're really, it's more like a slow breaching of a door. Um, but I, I do appreciate the compliment on behalf of this. <laughs> yeah, from the outside, I'll say. <laughs> it might look that way, but I can, I can assure you there has been no door. I know that it's, it certainly hasn't been an easy road. I certainly appreciate that. I know that there's a lot of a lot of writers like you guys working really hard to make this possible for the rest of us. Yeah, I mean, and I think it's also just, you know, publishing works really slow in any genre. And so getting people on board with something, I mean, I had to write 11 books, you know, before I could even breach the halls of a big, big five publisher. So it really is, you know, it's just a, a grind out there. And, and it's not even sometimes who the author is it's sometimes what stories will we be allowed to tell and, and I've been very lucky in that my my editor is very much are long for the ride on anything I will you know most things I want to do so but you know I know that's not the case for everyone but it is a very very slow <laughs> slow way in unfortunately in every genre so don't think you're missing anything too much here. <laughs> um so I want to we have, we might go over a few minutes because we have a couple more questions that, that I think are just really important. Um, Dina asked, um, how do you deal with people who em immigrated to the U.S. in the 70s and 80s? Like my, like we came over in the 70s and 80s and are kind of stuck there in their values and, and they're, they're sort of like the grass is greener in India type of thing. How do you keep your books relevant to the fact that India is moving forward and progressing um, and show India in the most current lights? And I'll start with um, Amelie on this. That's a hard question. You should have started with, with Alicia. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I just try to write from, I mean, it's different for me because I'm, my family goes back three generations when we're talking about India. So like what I try to do is just try to represent where I grew up, my immediate family, what cultures, practices and stuff that, you know, I've learned and tried to stay as authentic as I can to that. Um, we didn't really talk about sensitivity readers, but if I am talking about something that is outside of my lived experience, I mean, my publishers have been really great about getting sensitivity readers just to make sure that, you know, we are doing it, you know, writing respectfully and, you know, um, with, you know, being thoughtful to representing someone else, you know, as correctly as possible. But, um, I mean, I just do it from my own lived experience because that's what I know. Um, and I mean, maybe the others can probably give a better answer on that, especially as it relates to advances and stuff in India itself. Mm -hmm. Okay, Anika? Um, you know, I think that 
I, Alicia, I think you mentioned this earlier, right? That, you know, depending on when your wave of immigration came through, I think that that's something that plays into everyone's experience. And it's also going to cause a little bit of diversity of thought as is. And additionally, even for, you know, re- the experiences that I've had anyway, like even exp- the readers in India have a very wide range of what they consider a typical Indian experience, right? So some of them who grew up perhaps in cities with families who are maybe a little bit more liberal, a little bit more chill are like, you know, yeah, this is not at all what India is like. And then you'll have families who come through in India who are like, this is absolutely what India is like, you know, they're, they're, they're very conservative. And so there's, there's a whole range there to talk to, you know, to, to kind of speak to, um, even, even within India, let alone now when you're talking about a third culture and various, various waves of immigration across this third culture as well. Um, you know, I think that representing that is, is sort of, a little bit of a challenge. And I think it, it's always going to be a failure if that's the mission, um, you know, to try to represent India like as accurately as possible and, and to try to stay on top of all the trends because the truth is what's trendy for a wealthy population in a city might be a very different reality than for someone, you know, who's not and who who's, you know, working class in, you know, in a village or something. So it's, it's, it's I, I don't know that that's necessarily something that I... I think I try to be cognizant of it, obviously, whenever I'm writing out these characters and thinking about what their experience might be as with their backgrounds, but it's not something that I'm actively, I'm not trying to keep up with the Joneses, which is like a really old expression to actually use in this conversation. But like, you know, I just, I'm not trying to keep up with that, I think. Um, Monica, you can say we're keeping up with the Janeses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, you know, I'm just, I, I don't know that I'm necessarily trying to do that all the time because I think that trying to shoot with for the most current India is, is probably just not going to work at the end of the day. How about you, Alicia? Yeah, I, I think it's uh, impossible in a country full of billions and then a diaspora yeah. full of billions to ever get, you know, the exact pinpointed thing. Um, and also like people change. I mean, my, my siblings are, you know, roughly two decades younger than me. Um, they were raised very differently from I, from me by the same, mother, you know, like she was very different. And then she changed more over the years, you know, as they got older. So it's, we all have different, um, different snapshots that we're operating under and and that our parents are operating under and those shift the longer they're in this country, maybe they go in and out, who knows. Uh, So it's just different from every, for everyone. And I I know I wrote my first YA, it's coming out um, in 2023 called uh, While You Were Dreaming. And when I was writing it, one thing that I had to keep kind of keeping in mind was like, well, the first generation teenager struggle now is going to be different from when I was a first generation teenager. And if I write it like it's me, it's probably not going to resonate with the readers who it's intended for. Um, and the fact that I have younger siblings kind of helps me keep that in mind all the time. They keep me humble. So, uh, so yeah, it's just, it's impossible to get it exactly right to everybody. It's not... Uh, humanly possible. I hope even if I represent something in a way that somebody's not familiar with, they can at least relate to it or find something in there, some shared cultural touchstone that they can, you know, expand upon. That's that's all I can really hope for. Mm-hmm. Madi? Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't attempt to try to set a story in India. I, I've been there once. Um, I don't, you know, going back to what Alicia said about feeling competent, I don't feel competent to try to even take that on. So, I mean, all, all I can do is write about what I know and what my experience is. And, and again, just kind of going back to what everybody else said, that's, it's not going to be everyone's experience and, and that's okay. (laughs) That's why we need, you know, more of us. (laughs) Yeah. It sort of seems like we keep coming back to that question of like, how do we represent for such a wide range of, you know, and, and, you know, American same, you know, like if you're a white American writer, you also have this huge culture landscape that you can work from. So um, it'll be curious to see how we do it or you, because I'm not a writer. <laughs> um, so you have two more questions. One is um, about the spiciness of your books. And Madi, I know you don't write romance, so I'm, I have a separate question for you. But I would like to know, because there is this stereotype of Indians being sort of repressed or talk about sex. I mean, like, oh, my gosh, I could tell you stories about my mother not telling me anything. Um, 
<laughs> but that was my mother, you know? So writing romance, including sex, like erotic sex, uh, you know, uh, casual sex, whatever, in your books, is that um, something that, again, almost on a personal level, like, is your is your family okay with it? Is, you know, do you think that that's sort of representative as well? Just what's your thought on it? And I'm going to start with Annika about this one. I think if the story calls for it, then it calls for it. Like I think in romance, that's that's like the beauty of it is that you can, you know, you can put that in there and you can make a story just really balance and really shine. My stories personally are not, but that's honestly more because I just don't genuinely don't think that I'm very good at writing sex scenes. Um, my agent will back me up on that actually, because you know, like I tried multiple times and my agent's like, Did you suck? You're like, really, like, you know, you're like, really bad at this. And I'm like, yeah, like. There's a reason that we there's a fade to black here. It's just because I'm just not like that's just not where my talents come through the best, I think. So I leave that to more seasoned hands with with writers who are far better at making me turned on while I read their work than the other way around. So <laughs> I would um so yeah, I I you know, I think that that's it's completely fine and and I understand the hesitancy. I do understand like people worrying about, you know, what what people might think, what their families might think, et cetera. But, um, but, you know, I think if, if it came down to it and, and, and I wanted to write it, I don't know if there's very much stopping me besides sheer talent. So. <laughs> Alicia. Yeah. I mean, nobody's shunned me yet. So I think I'm, I'm pretty well, everyone's coming to the wedding, so I'm not too worried. Um, I, for me, writing a sex scene is like blocking a fight scene. Like it's no different. It's just part of the craft. Um, it's, it's a slightly different part of the craft and that it is, it does have an emotional element that you do have to work on, but I've been doing it now for so long that it's, it's, it's just a part of the story. And it's funny. Cause I think somebody the other day, you know, you get that question a lot, like, Oh, where do you get your inspiration? And, you know, it's usually like a wink, wink, nudge, nudge. And uh, my family and I were together and they pointed to him and they're like, Oh, does it come from him? And I was like, yes, actually one time he let me when um at Scrabble and I put that in a book and I don't think that's really what they meant but I was like that's where that's the kind of thing that you know I, I grasp so it's it's just a part of the book and I think most people at least um most readers you know are, are on board with that and my family fully understands that mm -hmm. I think as a reader I think it's refreshing to have Indians have a healthy sexual relationship in books which you have I just never saw it growing up, you know, we didn't talk about sex. So like having it in a book was like, oh, this is awesome. <laughs> so, um, Amelie. My husband likes to go to events and pretend, tell everyone that he's the cover model. So like, I have to deal with that. Uh, <laughs> you know, when it comes to like questions like those. But I mean, when I write, especially for adult romance, um, I love, Mina, that you just said, you know, about healthy relationships. I want my relationships, regardless of the color of the skin of the characters, to be about, you know, healthy, layered, uh, emotional, sexy, to address female pleasure, female agency, and, you know, no matter the color. Like, it, to me, I just want it to be mainstream. Like, I just want it to be like, you go on there and you read about, you know, I don't have, well, I don't know if we could say this on this a library thing, but, you know, like, female hearts that are brown. Let's talk about those in, in positive ways because I'm a brown person. I want to read about those things in a sexy, well-written sex scene. And mm -hmm. I love seeing that in books that include um, people of color. And, you know, I just, I want to see more of it. And I love, I love reading sexy time books. I love them. Me too. I do have to say that I'm always surprised that people ask romance authors about their own sex lives why wouldn't you, I mean, like you would ask, you wouldn't ask a, you know, a, a thriller writer if they've like, you know, jumped out of a plane recently. Yeah, murder yes. someone. Yeah, murder, murder someone. somebody. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So I, I just find that very, very interesting um, that people feel so comfortable asking you these questions. So Madi, my question for you in this, in this realm is about, um, do you think that women's fiction is respected in the Indian community? Um, I know that you said that there's not a lot of it out there. So I'm just wondering if it's something that is becoming more and more respected. I mean, I think that women's fiction just kind of gets a bad rap in general, not just in the South Asian community, right? Like there's no dude fiction. Right? So <laughs> why is there women's fiction? I think just women's fiction in general kind of is like, oh, it's, you know, it's like a little light, it's a little fluffy. And like neither of my books that I've written are light or fluffy. You know, my first book, there's, you know, someone dies. It's, you know, it's all kind of, 
there's a lot of serious stuff in there. Um, and yet it was still classified as women's fiction. So I'm not really sure what that's about, but um, you know, it's a little bit about the patriarchy or a lot about the patriarchy. Um, and that is, you know, so much a part of publishing, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, I think they, you know, is it respected in the South Asian community? I mean, I think it kind of gets the same amount of flack that it gets just widely, you know, for being kind of an in, like quote unquote inferior form of literature because it's not literary fiction or contemporary fiction. But the line between those things is is so arbitrary. Um, so I read a lot of books that are classified as contemporary fiction um, that have female main characters and could very well be uh, classified as women's fiction. And it's really, you know, it just comes down to a marketing choice on the part of the publisher. Um, and, you know, hopefully we're making strides in that area. But they, like like Alicia said, things change slowly in publishing. Mm. Well, hopefully we'll speed them up a little bit. The more we'll make lots of noise as readers. Um, then my last question really is, what is up next for you? What can we look forward to from you um, in the coming year, Annika? I have book two of the Chai Masala Club coming out in May of 2023. Um, it's called Sugar, Spice, and Can't Play Nice. And the cover it was just released two weeks ago, I think. Um, and it's really pretty. And I'm very, I mean, I'm a little biased, but I think it's beautiful. Um, <laughs> and it's about a couple who is asked to marry each other to, or two people who are asked to marry each other on behalf of their family to save their businesses, but they had a one night stand last week and they actually hate each other. So, um, it kind of starts there and launches in, it's a little bit different than love chai features, um, the same the core group of friends, which is, which is really fun, but it has, um, it's less steeped in like the angsty trauma side of culture and is more like, you know, just sort of just a, like it's more of a traditional rom-com to be honest, um, which is, which is fun. It was fun to write. One of my favorite tropes, <laughs> Alicia. Yeah, I have uh, Partners in Crime coming out in October. It's mm -hmm. a, a bit of a departure from my other rom-coms. It's uh, more of a caper. Um, it's about a couple of exes who, um, you know, parted not on great terms. And she has a bunch of secrets and they get kidnapped together and they have uh, one wild night in Vegas to figure it all out and, and save their lives. So uh, that is coming out in October. That's my adult romance. And then my next, uh, in March, I have uh, my YA While You Were Dreaming coming out. And uh, it's my first debut YA and I'm really excited about it. And I hope people are too. I am. <laughs> Maddie? Um, so I'm working on book three and I am a pantser, so I can't tell you what it's about because I'm not entirely sure yet. Um, I just kind of wing it um, when I'm writing. I know it's about um, two sisters and that's pretty much all I got at this point. So hopefully sometime in 2023, maybe 2024 at this rate. All right. Well, we'll look forward to that. Amelie? Oh, I'm going to show my cover because it's awesome. It comes out in... Uh... November. It's so sexy. He looks like McDreamy. Anyway, this is with Sourcebooks and it's about spies and shenanigans and traveling to America and, you know, a, a young uh, heiress who just wants to, you know, do something different with her life. And then she meets this man that she's always had a crush on and he's like an ex uh, spy for the crown. And, you know, he's trying to find um, a, 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 an operative who's been avoiding him and it turns out to be her. So I think that's awesome. And then uh, <laughs> next year, my uh, YA with uh, uh, Penguin Random House Joy Revolution comes out. This cover is flipping awesome because this girl, like the representation on it is just beautiful. Um, and that's Bridgerton meets the Count of Monte Cristo. It's a fully uh, diverse cast. I'm really excited about it. Um, and then in July, I have my next rom-com historical coming out with Forever. And that's Never Met a Duke Like You. And it's kind of loosely based on Clueless. The <laughs> first one came out last month and that was based on Pretty Woman. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> so many great books to look forward to. Um, so I, I kind of lied. I, I have actually one more question. Sorry. Um, can you name one Indian author that you would like to recommend our um, um, attendees to read that is not here? I'll start. Nalini Singh. Alicia. <laughs> Definitely Nisha. Nisha Sharma. Nisha Sharma. Uh, Madi. I was also going to say Nisha Sharma. <laughs> I, I figured I'd snag I kind of snagged her actually Alicia I'm just saying <laughs> <laughs> <Got her first. laughs> 
Hmm. Anybody else other than Alicia? <laughs> like um, Nisha Sherman, because I love her. Oh, um, I'll say I'll say Somia Dave, who's a women's fiction writer who's Ooh, really great. Amazing. Yeah. Yes. Um, I will always talk. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Annika. I'm going to say Sonali Dave, obviously. Um, I She's probably the first, maybe the first South Asian romance writer I read. I uh, might be wrong. Um, but yeah, I think she was the first one, actually. And see, she had a soft spot. Um, but also um, Namrtha Patel as well. Her her last her recent one is is like really I don't know it just really hit me close. Her main character is named Mina, so I love that book. <laughs> <laughs> and Amelie, no. um, yeah, I was also gonna say Sonali. I love her books, um, but also for why Shayla Patel is a really good friend. She's an awesome writer, and then Sienna Snow. She writes mafia romance that is really spicy, and she is also um, a good friend. So. Oh, awesome. Well, oh my gosh, I'm so excited about all of these. Um, thank you so much for being here and answering all of my questions. I still actually have more, but I know you probably got have stuff to do like writing and life and stuff that. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you all for being here for and joining us with your questions and your thoughts. Um, you can buy signed books from Bank Score Books. The link is in the chat and I will send out a, um, a recap with um, the video link as well as any of the resources. So, um, Thank you, Madi, Amli, Anika, Alicia. This has been really lovely, and I really appreciate your time and thoughtfulness in all of all of this because it's so important to understand where we're coming from. I forgot to add Mona Shroff. Can I add her in really fast? <laughs> yes, you can. Me too. Okay. <laughs> I know. Like once you start thinking about it, there's, there are so many, you know. But I kind of put you all on the spot. <laughs> um, yeah. So awesome. have, thank you. Yeah. Have a wonderful night, and um, we look forward to all of your future books. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.